here we are again with another conversation uh, with um, people that are educators, I guess, that are impacted where we all are or with the COVID-19. And I'm pleased today to have Pernille Ripp, who is, well, she doesn't need an introduction, I don't think. <laughs> uh, but I know her. I know her as, uh, I guess this is my, I, I'll let her introduce herself, but if I know uh, Pernil as, uh, number one, uh, a very thoughtful, caring educator, first and foremost, um, who uh, shows her vulnerability and her curiosity through her blog, and she's also an author. Um, a lot of people would know her from Global Read Aloud, but uh, she also has uh, assumed positive testing for COVID-19, so she had that experience uh, under her belt and add to her repertoire of empathetic uh, <laughs> capacity, I suppose. But anyways, Pernia, why don't you tell us where you are and introduce yourself the way you would like to be introduced. I think you did a fabulous job. Um, currently, I'm sitting in my bedroom in Madison, Wisconsin, my adopted home state. I was born and raised in Denmark and came here as an adult. And uh, yeah, we've been, I think we've been home now since March 13th. <laughs> and we've assumed now that every day is just day. There's no kind of weekday anymore. Um, I teach. I teach seventh grade English in Oregon, Wisconsin. And uh, I'm a mom as well to four kids. And Dean Shiresky is the reason that I get to speak around the world. And I don't even know if Dean knows that, but he's the reason that people started hiring me as a speaker a long time ago. So I owe him maybe a few kids or chocolate or <laughs> something. So we we go many years back. Well, you're, this is your this is your payback uh, for that now anyway. So I guess we can call it even. Um, so first question is, what are you, and I know uh, you're working very hard to try to figure out your role as an educator, but from a from an official capacity in Wisconsin and Madison, what are you being told is your job now? So I have been really excited about my district direction with all of this as we're all just kind of building the airplane in flight because my district has continued its course where it has said to us, you know, our students' well-being and our community's well-being is top one priority. Yes, academics would be fantastic, and we want you to create opportunities that are equitable and accessible and manageable to our students, but really we are so much more concerned just with the well-being of kids. And while I hear that a lot, I also feel like what we've been told from the state level and from the county level and from the district level is also allowing us to do that. You know, they're re they're removing requirements as far as like the, the stupid state tests. They're re removing requirements as far as minutes. They've changed our grades to pass fail. Um, and I think the biggest thing, like I see it in in the daily interactions that we have as a district, where the focus is much more: do we have contact with this child? Are they okay? Versus, oh, are they doing their work? Why aren't they doing their work? And so when we did go go into shutdown mode. It happened really quickly, kind of Friday, March 13th, we, we got the, you know, after school was out, we were told, okay, we're shutting down as of Wednesday, you'll have Monday and Tuesday with students, Sunday afternoon, they were like, oh, you're done, you're not coming back. So there was no handoff, there was no goodbye. And my district stepped in and said, okay, you know what, first things first, we need to make sure that our families are fed. How can we get food to them? And that was really like that first week of being shut down, that was the priority. And I feel like that's the line that we've taken since then. Yes, of course, we wanna provide learning opportunities for the kids that can access it and have the mental space to do so. But more importantly, we wanna make sure that they're getting the mental health support, the food support, the financial support, or getting them connected with places where they can be supported. Um, and and that's you know that shows the leadership that's happening around that because that's not a perennial decision by any any means that's me following the directions that are being pushed my way. So what uh, just anything specific too because again I'm always pleased when I hear that and that's I haven't heard anything different. You see you read bits and pieces of some places where teachers are being asked to do really uh, just almost inhumane kind of things in terms of continuing this role but most for the most part that's that's a consistent message but can you give me a, like is there a specific uh outreach that you had whether it's by a principal or, or another district person like just a specific message that you thought i needed to hear that and that that's what's what's sustaining me 
Yeah, there were two messages in particular that really have helped me wrap my head around what I'm supposed to be doing as an educator. The first message came early on in my district where they sent out and they said, okay, whatever you have planned for the first week, cut it in half and then cut it in half again. And I think for me, that was so good because I was sitting there going, I don't have enough. This is not enough. This is not rigorous enough. This is not challenging. This is not what I'm supposed to be doing. And so to hear from other administrations saying, whatever you've already planned, is going to be too much and you need to scale way back was such a, a sigh of relief because then I felt like, okay, I can do the things that my common sense and my gut is telling me to do um, when we have that permission. I probably would have done that anyway, but to be able to be out in the open about that. And it wasn't just in the beginning. They continued to tell us that. They continue to come back and say, it's too much. We need to do less. Don't worry so much about the grades. We will pick up the pieces when the kids are back with us in September. I think the other thing that I didn't realize how much I needed was I was spending an awful lot of time worrying about my students, especially the minute we shut down our computer, right? The minute we're not sitting there waiting by our email uh, was hard for me. And, and, and I was having a very hard time just balancing the work-life balance, which I'm sure so many people are. Our district put in place that Every, uh, every night from 4 until 10 p.m., they have a support hotline for mental health needs. And it's mm -hmm. staffed, and a kid can go in and, and put in a form and say, I need a call, and somebody calls them that night. And while that's for mental health and that kind of support, I was talking to a guidance counselor about it who was part of that initiation of that. And I said, you know what? That also allows me to step away from my computer because I know that if a kid reach, reaches out, somebody's there to hear them. And for me, that was that sigh of going, okay, they will be okay. There are more people that are worried about this kid, which I already knew, but there's a, there's a safety net in place that we didn't have before. And it's, they've been using it and they've been reaching out. And I think we're, we're connecting with kids in a deeper way because of that. So I would say those two specific things, but I think just the re repetition too of slow down, take a step back, you know, nobody's going to fail. Nobody is going to not be able to pursue their life dreams by stopping this education for the next couple months. We'll pick up the pieces. That's what we do as educators and we'll figure it out together. And, and what percentage of students do you feel like you're struggling to connect with because just whatever it's access or they're just, their lives are in such a way that they're not engaging and, and that's not even a judgment on them. It's just like, what percentage of students do you feel like, yeah, I've got this, these are even number of students. Do you feel like I've just, I haven't connected with them the way I would like, and I'm somewhat concerned about that. So we have a team approach, which I love so much. Um, we have a team meeting every week where we put in, if we're not hearing from a child and the minute it's more than three teachers, coming from the middle school background, there's at least eight teachers connected to each child. Um, the minute it's more than three, then it's like, what's our next step? And the first thing we've done is we have a point person there. This is, we've already tried to email ourselves. We're not getting anything. Okay. Are we calling? Is it, is it uh, the principal? Is it administration? Is it a police wild, uh, well child check, you know, that needs to show up at the door and mm -hmm. go, are you okay? Nobody is hearing from you. Um, I've noticed I'd say so out of about 150 kids on my team, our list is about 20 kids right now where we're not getting, not even, we're not even talking academics here. We're talking about just like, is anyone hearing from them? Very few people are, or it's like one line answers and we're worried. What we're noticing though too is that the list is growing. And um, I think that makes sense because this is also now where those who are taking care of the kids are losing their jobs. And so there's even more uh, instability being en uh, entered into some of our kids' lives. And also like some kids are just, they're, they're overwhelmed and they're burned out. And this now becomes the, the head on the table, right? Like when we used to put our head down because we were like, I just need a moment. Now it's instead, I'm not gonna answer your email or I'm not gonna do your assignment or I'm not even gonna do your survey saying, are you okay? Because I'm not okay. And this is how I'm gonna communicate that with you. And so, it's been interesting to see, yes, there were kids that we would expect that it would be harder to maintain con connection with, and we kind of had teams in place for those, but there are new kids cropping up as well, that, you know, this is just, this isn't school, and, and, and this isn't what they need right now, and so what can we offer them instead? If it's not so much the focus on the academic, how can we just make sure that they're doing okay? 
Well, and I think it raises that interesting point because the, the paths are, are going like this because I think there are those that are getting into a groove. They figured out, okay, so this is how we'll have to set things up and and um, we've, we've kind of figured out a routine and they're kind of locked in for a bit. And then there's others, as you say, who new challenges are coming out and they're going further away. And so that, again, it always comes back to an equity issue. It's like that's, it's the gap is widening. And, and that's the part I think that for me, I am just being hit constantly. Every time I hear it is like, this is, it's getting like, it's getting wider, right? Because again, there's going to be, there's, there's amazing stories out there of families who are reconnecting, who are, who are uh, finding out what really is important to them and, and, and developing relationships with their kids. That's great. And that's positive. And those, and those people are, um, are going to come out of this, um, better for it and then we have this other side of the coin where it's it just keeps getting worse so that's i mean i mean if we ever had to deal with equity in a classroom that's nothing like we're having to deal with it now and you know right. we're, we're limited in what we could like like it's the stuff you're telling me just like that's amazing that you've got all those things in place but it's just never going to be enough like it doesn't matter what you do you're never going to have enough and that also shows like the privilege within my district we have enough people to sit and man a support line at night. We have enough devices to get a device to every family. We have the resources to get food to our families, right? What about all the districts that don't have those resources that were already strapped for cash, underfunded, under-resourced? And so when we talk about the gap, it's not just the individual students. It's once again, district to district, state to state, country mm -hmm. to country, right? Who has the safety nets for these kids? And I'll tell you this too, like even as I sit and now try to put my own kids um, through their online experience, even with everything that I have available to them in my house, it is not good. So I can't imagine sitting in a household with parents who are both working or maybe there's a single, single uh, parent figure in the, in the household or a caregiver who's working or maybe your internet is unreliable, or maybe your device just broke, or whatever it is, mm. like, we can produce beautiful lessons. That doesn't mean that kids can access mm -hmm. them. And so what I'm thinking, too, is like, if there's one thing that comes out of this, I hope that the continued focus on equity within education becomes even bigger, because people have been screaming about this for years. So many people have done the groundwork on this. And some people are finally getting kind of their eyes open. And I hope that, that this really becomes an even bigger conversation because this has completely laid bare, if you somehow had missed it before, laid bare all of the inequities that are completely embedded within it, our educational system. That it is not just pull up your bootstraps and work hard and you will be fine. You know, that there is no equal access to education in any way. Well, and that I am definitely in that category of being confronted with something I wasn't, I mean, I was, and I'm not even on the front lines. I'm not even, you know, dealing with kids, but just the conversations I've had have made me think, oh yeah, like this, and this equity thing is, and you know, I think sometimes the equity issues are, are ones that I feel, you know, inadequate to respond to because, you know, whether it's a race issue or whatever else you feel like, well, I'm not really qualified to talk about that. Um, and I don't, even know that I, I'm not qualified. That's not the issue. The issue is like, I just need to keep pushing and asking the people with like, how are we dealing with this? Like, even if that's all that I do from now on is just ask people about like, how do we recover from, you know, and how do we help families who are struggling and kids that are struggling and parents that are struggling? Cause it's like, it is, it's so complex. It's just so, so many facets to it. Um, just want to shift gears a little bit. I'll put, put your mom hat on and you talked about it a little bit, but just from being a mom, uh, dealing with school age children. Uh, just talk a little bit about that experience. I thought my husband and I would be pretty good at this. And it turns out that we're just not. Despite me having 12 plus years as an educator working with all sorts of ages, despite my husband almost being finished with his education degree, despite their teachers creating perfect, wonderful, interactive, engaging lessons, my kids hate this more than anything. I have all the tools. I should be in a position where this is a breeze, but this is not homeschooling. You know, this is just really poor substitute teaching. And as my six-year-old reminded me after she threw a seven-hour fit over writing for 10 minutes, you know, this school sucks. 
And I agree because we can certainly sit and do the academics and, and check off the little box that, that we did the math, we did the reading, we did the Spanish and all of that, but it's not true school. There's no interaction. This is just get it done and then be done. And my kids can't wait to be done. And so I think about the privilege that we sit with in my house where we have equity and access to everything that they need and then some, and we're still not doing this well. So when I get emails from my students, caregivers and parents saying, this isn't working, I'm like, yep, I understand that. Do what you can because ultimately, you're the one that's gonna have to tell me what's working for you and your family. My husband has also been good at pulling me back and saying, it's okay, walk away we'll pick it up tomorrow. They will still be able to have beautiful, successful lives later on in life, even if they don't do that part of their lesson today. And for me, that's been hard to kind of stomach because of course, I want my kids to get everything done and to do all of their learning, but that's not what they need right now. If they're in a spot where their behavior is telling me that that's not gonna work, then I need to listen to their behavior more than the rule follower in the back of my head. Well, and I think it speaks to, uh, you know, I, I, I know I've spent a lot of time thinking and talking about the, the whole notion of community, right? The fact that learning is this social experience and that, and that we waste so much opportunity when we do have children in a building together by using words like, uh, you know, mind your own business, keep your eyes on your own paper, like all that kind of that kind of talk that, that really uh, suggests that learning is a contract between a teacher and a student and the rest of the people in the room is irrelevant. And I think what we're finding right now is that that's just not true for students in particular. For us, maybe as educators, sometimes that's how, you know, I think we get it. Okay, there's other kids in the room and we'll do some social interactions and learning and so forth. But I think what, what we're seeing right now as evidenced by your own kids is that for them, that is the priority. Like, learning will happen like and that's that's what i keep saying learning is going to happen whether they're in school or not because they're learning all the time they're learning whatever they're you know whatever if they're playing a game if they're you know uh having a fit with their parents that's learning too i mean it, it's <laughs> all learning <laughs> it's all learning yeah. right but but that notion that that schools have this great advantage of bringing people together that does that social thing and it, and it also i think i'm also realizing how much even though it's not perfect, it does address inequities at many times because we are able to see children have a better chance of seeing children as equal as opposed to, well, that kid has this and has that. I mean, those things still exist, but there's elements of that that we need to lean into and tap into and say, we've got to do a better job of, of uh, making this experience social for children, emphasizing that that's a big deal because it may happen come, in, come fall that maybe kids are only going to go to school three days a week or whatever. I mean, there's all kinds of scenarios that are being tossed out there, but then it just puts more emphasis. If you're only going to be there three days a week or how many hours a day, whatever, then make sure that the experience is about being with other people, thinking, learning, playing with other people. I, I just, yeah. these are just and things. Reacting, as you're right? Yeah. And I, I think because that's it, like, I had a couple of kids, I had one kid in particular at the beginning of this who said, Oh, I love this way of learning. I wish we could do this all the time. She said, because it's so efficient. Yeah, I can go through all my stuff. Nobody's there to disrupt me. I can get it all done. I'm done in an hour and a half or two hours or whatever it is. But now, when I spoke to her on week five, she goes, I miss school. She goes, I miss, I miss the goofiness, right? The little moments, the community that, did you see this? Let me show you this. How are you going to react to the words that I wrote? Oh my gosh, I read this book. I want you to read it. Like all the human pieces, which I love working on in English anyway, that idea of like, how do you learn best? It's not always the most efficient way, but it's the most effective because we feel seen and grounded as human beings. And that's what makes school so special. And that's what my kids miss, right? It's not the, oh man, I really love my math class. It's I love my math teacher and I love the kids that were sitting in that class who didn't make me feel stupid when I didn't know an answer, who you know lent me their pencil, who knew which problem I was supposed to be doing before I did. That's the little pieces that are missing here. And I think about too, even the well-being of kids, right? I, I, I'm supposed to have a lot of academic check-ins with my students and I certainly have those, but more so most of our time is simply spent on just going, how are you? Tell me about your life. How are you doing? I miss you too, you know? And, and we sit and we reminisce and what a strange situation to be in. 
to sit and already go, I miss you. I, I wish we had had more time together. And so I agree that going forward, we cannot just have, and I've seen districts already start to make plans. We cannot just have plans where, well, this is how we'll access the academic. It really has to be, how are we going to, how are we going to support the whole child knowing that school's probably never going to go back to what it was now? And it shouldn't, right? School shouldn't go back to what it was now because we have massive inequities that the experts have been telling us about for years. Now is a great time to start listening to that and really think, rethinking some aspects of school. Well, and to me, it, you know, it goes back to, again, another idea that I continue to, to push because I think it's important one is what do we lead with? Because the answer is always both. Like, oh, are we going to address the, are we going to address the whole child? Or are we going to focus more on academics? And, and as for years as educators, our answer would always be, oh, we're going to do both. We're going to do all those things. But the challenge of it is there's, there are some competing goals here because your students for as great as they might be, they aren't as focused on academics. So we feel like we have to sort of, you know, fight to, to feed them, all this stuff instead of saying why don't we why don't we lead with the social why don't we lead with the emotional why don't we lead with the whole child and then we'll figure out the academic um alongside of that and and i mean we're smart enough to be able to create all kinds of experiences for kids that they're gonna that they should love and that are rich and and um you know and and uh, high high academically um positioned so i i don't think that's a problem but again i think I think it comes from realizing what matters and what's important and what do we lead with and let's make sure we get these things right. Then we'll, the other things will do the both, but you can't always try to do everything for all kids. You've got to have to make a stand and say, this is where we're going to lead with. And it was interesting. I had another great conversation with people who talk about this is a time when your when your um, principles and values are tested. Cause if you believe these things, like this is the time when they're going to show and and uh, if you don't have great if your values are on academics if that's your number one value then i think right now you're struggling more than the people who said that's not our number one value like again it's a value it's important but it's not it's not priority so it's, it's just very interesting how this is revealing so many uh so many things the inequities amongst children but also uh values of, of educational institutions right and how many school districts have beautiful vision statements that have nothing to do with the, what they're actually implementing? You know, you're not going to meet a school district that's like, well, we don't value children. And yet right yeah. now we're very much seeing on an amplified basis, well, is it the child you value or is it their, the academic content? You know, and, and there's a, the, yes, there's definitely a relationship there, but in what order should it be right now? So just as we, a couple of questions as we close. One is, uh, okay, so you, you told me what a bad parent you are as far as, you're not a bad parent, <laughs> but a bad much. substitute teacher. But there's yeah. got to be, tell me something just sort of fun, because you're, uh, one of the things I always loved about you sharing is, you know, uh, you've got lots of stories. I think, it, is Oscar the name of one of your sons? Yes, my son. Yeah, yeah. Lots of good Oscar, Oscar stories, but I'm sure <laughs> in general, like what kind of things that just make you go, okay, this is so stupid, it's funny moments I think you know just like the sneakiness my kids have have taken sneakiness to a new level because mom and dad are always around and so it's the hiding in the closet doing things that they know they shouldn't be doing you know it's trying to push it off on people who don't exist in our house and then it's also the, the but at the same time it's also the camaraderie it's very much children versus adults at times in our house right now because that's you know that's the only way you can split it but at the same time, too, I've also seen this calm come over our house now, now that we're in week five or six or seven or whatever week we're in, of, uh, of, of banding together and realizing that we're going to make this work for everybody. I think the latest thing that happened in our house was that we finally allowed our two youngest, Oscar being one of them, um, to go to the park unsupervised yesterday just down the street. And uh, he fractured his elbow falling out of a tree last night or yesterday. And so, uh, you know, you, we got to go to urgent care and I just, I was like, this is what happens when I give permission for you to float free in the world. My husband's like, no, 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 this is not what happens. <laughs> He's like, this is just a freak accident. I was like, they're never going to go anywhere unsupervised again. But then I think about my, my own Danish upbringing, which was, you know, run out the door and come back when it's dark. And so I guess if all he got was a fractured elbow, I, I'd say we're doing okay as parents. But it's been interesting too to figure out the hierarchy and the changing favoritism within my children 
as far as who they favor as their favored sibling and then how they use exclusionary tactics to make sure everybody else knows who they want to play with. And so it does sometimes feel a little bit like having a classroom of conflicting personalities and, and repeatedly saying everybody needs to get along. But at the same time, too, what a, what a lucky time this is. We've been planting. We've been watching all of the Marvel movies in chronological order. We've been baking, and, uh, and we've been telling them to go to bed and get some sleep so that we can sit in the quiet and not be around other people. My husband and I are both introverts. My children are incredibly extroverted, and that has been um, a challenge for sure for all, uh, all parties. Well, um, I, uh, I, I definitely, uh, my empathy is growing. Uh, we've got the two grandchildren with us, which uh, I don't have to look after them the way you do, but they still tire me out by the end of the day. But uh, these close quarters are making for some, for some interesting uh, tales. And, and, and that's, that was one of the things I heard from somebody the other day is like, everybody should be journaling hard right now because in five or 10 years, <laughs> somebody's going to want to know Tell us about the great pandemic of 2020. And these are the kind of stories that, you know, in the end become more interesting than, you know, a lot of the, uh, the real more serious stories. These are the human sides of, of this experience and, and kind of what we're all, what we're all craving right now is, is some, some humanity to come out of all this. So. But at the same time, can you really journal? I took the journaling very seriously in the beginning of this as an English teacher, I was going to create a primary source document for historians to, marvel at later on. But then I realized that the things that I was writing down was we are still at, the, at home. The weather is still terrible. I did the laundry. I watched TV. You know, it was just the mundanity of it all. I read a beautiful article that talked about how this was the great pause. And I love that so much. And that really reframed it for me where I was like, it is the great pause. We get to yeah. just narrow in, hopefully, if we're in a place where it's safe to do so, and just sit with each other and try to make the best out of it. But I, again, like what a privilege that is in itself, that mm -hmm. I can look at this totally. whole experience and go, oh, I got time with my kids. This is incredible. And then I think about the people where, you know, they don't have their income. They don't have st stable housing. They don't have stable food sources. They are a lot sicker than what I was. You know, for them, it's not the great pause. It's a great no. strategy. So I think about that too and, and consider myself, you know, what can I do to help others yeah. as much as I can? Um, and, 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 and not just say, well, Absolutely. we're in this together because we're not. We're all living different experiences. But yeah, and, and again, I, I'm, the, the, the good news is I'm confident that people like you, and educators like you, you know, acknowledge those, um, those differences and are, you know, will be equipped, I think, better equipped, I hope, that uh, to be able to, to help those that, that need more help and, and take some of the, the good fortune and good things that we've been blessed with to be able to share with others. So, And I think that's why, too, like I've taken the approach here as usual, as I have been for the last 10 years, to be completely 100% honest with what's happening at my house right now, what's going through my head. Because I certainly don't need more perfect teacher voices out there going, oh, we have a beautiful color coordinated schedule and my kids are just little angels and we're all learning Taekwondo together. You know, yes, that's amazing if that's where you're at. But in my house, it's, oh my gosh, today was a good day because we actually did everything and they actually picked up the rooms and here's what that looks like. And I think that that's really important because right now is not the time to be comparing yourself to others, right? Right now, we're all doing the best we can. We're hope, hoping, hopefully so. And whatever we create is going to be good enough. And we need to be okay with that. And so I think having honesty about what this looks like, especially when you are put up on a pedestal as some sort of educational expert in any way to say, <laughs> I may be a decent seventh grade teacher, but I'm not winning any awards right now at my house. <laughs> not even like mom of the year. Like that's not even <laughs> happening. <laughs> Well, thanks so much for your time, your honesty, your openness, and I think uh, I think what you share will be helpful to a lot of people who, uh, you know, again, uh, just naturally try to compare themselves and think they're not doing, they're not measuring up, but, you know, the reality is that none of us are quite measuring up to what we want because we're not put in a position to be that way. So thank you for taking time to do this, and I want you to rest and be well and enjoy your family and... Uh, hopefully soon we'll be able to see each other in a, in a better setting than this. That would be lovely. Thank you, Dean. Take care of yourself. You too.